From the Fox News Podcast Network, I'm Dana Perino, and everything will be okay. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Everything Will Be Okay. This week, I'm joined by a financial analyst and the host of Making Money with Charles Payne on the Fox Business Network. Charles is an incredible person. You've probably seen him on Fox News. If you don't know Charles, I'm excited for you to get to listen to him. He has over 30 years of experience reporting on the ebbs and flows of the stock market. He was raised by a single mom. You'll hear this story. His parents divorced when he was about 12. He was the oldest. He had two younger brothers. And Charles really had to dig deep and do a lot to help provide for his family And ultimately, he found his passion following the latest finance news out of Wall Street and the actual Wall Street Journal. Charles's life and career, it's a true testament to drive, persistence, and faith. And with those three things, you really can achieve incredible dreams, as he has. Let's listen to him here. Charles, a lot of people know you from television, and you're amazing at what you do. But where did it all start? Can you, just to set the stage for this conversation and from where you come from, a person of, one, expertise in what you do, but experience in this issue of education. Tell, take us back. Give us a beginning. I got to go way back. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. I'm going to make you do that. Let's go to the childhood because I think you're right. I think it is important, uh, yep. particularly in my case. Uh, so I had two childhoods. And my first childhood was all military bases, Army bases. My father was in the Army. Uh, so I was born in New York. The next brother after me was born in Pittsburgh. The next one was born in Texas. <laughs> then we lived in Germany, came back to Pittsburgh, lived in Japan, went to Texas, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia. Uh, and then it was at that point where one day I came home from school and my mom said, hey, we're leaving. Uh, so, you know, her and my father had problems and... So me and my mom and my two younger brothers all got on a bus. We left Fort Lee, Virginia. We lived in a two-story house, beautiful, big lawn, never locked the doors. We had the staircase like the Brady Bunch. Like, it was just so idyllic. It was so beautiful. You go outside, you ride your bike all day. Uh, You come home, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and go back out and ride your bike all day. You know, it was just this amazing life. And all four of us, we left with no money. We got to New York, got to Harlem, which in the 70s, early 70s, the most dangerous, poorest neighborhood in America. You know, the first day, the first, when we got here. And was how a, old were you? I was 12. Okay. And I was the oldest of the, of the kids. And what was amazing, just to get, first of all, to see the train, right? The subway train was amazing. The Iron Horse. And back then, they still had some really old ones, right? <laughs> it was truly strap hangers. Uh, and, and then to come out the train station, and here we are in Harlem, and uh, first of all, the energy, Dana, was so amazing. If, if, you know, you, you, if you've never been around anything like that, music everywhere. Every car that went by had music. People walking around with boom boxes had music. People had speakers in their window had music. And I'm talking music like I was rocking Elton John, right, which is cool. You know, Philadelphia Freedom, that kind of stuff. But Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes blew my mind, right? So I'm, so I'm seeing Double Dutch for the first time. And all of that stuff was absolutely amazing. But then came the other stuff, the hard stuff, right? And the poverty, the anger, the anguish, um, it's just, you know, we weren't prepared for it. I, I, I wasn't prepared for it. You know, we moved all those times. And every time we went to a new place, the house was freshly painted. Every time you turned on the hot water, hot water came out. You know, we lived in this. We lived in a room initially. All four of us lived in a room at a friend of my mom, and um, I guess about a month and a half, two months later, we got our own apartment. But that first winter, we barely ever had heat or hot water. It was very rare. So again, those were things I never, ever, ever experienced, and I never experienced poverty before. I never even knew what it was like to open a cupboard and not see food. You know, and uh, so I was the oldest. And as the oldest, I was thrusted into action. I hadn't thought about money a single day of my life, and that's all I had to think about as trying to help my mom. And initially, I would do things like clean windshields at stoplights. I would buy Windex and paper towels, and I got a job at a bodega. And I guess like anybody else, 
at a certain age, you start to equate money with Wall Street. <laughs> and I mean, just, all right, you know, so I go and I start getting the Wall Street Journal. And I, and I, and back then it was so hard to read. If anybody could ever pick up a 1974 Wall Street Journal, it's all lines and numbers. That's all it is. It's crazy. So it took me a few months of reading these journals to sort of start picking up on it. But when I was 14, I told my mom, I'm going to work on Wall Street. And what what was her reaction to that? She, she liked the idea? She did. She okay. did. She, um, you know, it was beautiful. Uh, sorry. But just, right. um, yeah, we're coming up on the anniversary of her death. Mm-hmm. Um, she was the only one. Is that right? She was the only one. Who, because it's um, risky. Well, it wasn't about risk. It was, it was about there's no no one believed a black person in my neighborhood. A black person could work on Wall Street. Yeah, yeah, OK, point. it was about risk. No one cared about risk. Risk is selling drugs. Risk is stealing something and getting shot in the back. There's so much risk. Risk walking out of my door every day and walking over winos and junkies. Mm-hmm. That's risk. Mm-hmm. That's risk. I, I face greater risk being an A student in my school and getting beat up for trying to act like a white boy. That's tell what me, they called me. Tell me a little bit about that then. The, the, the daily occurrences? Yeah, like when you went to school, <clears throat> you're a smart guy. And it was tough. It was yeah. tough because I loved school. Mm-hmm. I really did. And I loved social studies. And, you know, when I was in third grade, uh, I was in, we were in Okinawa, Japan. And my teacher used to have two students stand up at the same time, my math teacher. And she would ask a question. Whoever got it right, the other student would have to sit down. I would go through the whole class, bam, knock them all off, knock them all off. So she was moving, and she, uh, she had me stand up her last day in class, and she says, Charles is the best student I've ever had. So I loved school. And so, you know, I'm going, you know, I'm in school, I'm all eager, and I'm answering questions, and I'm talking to the teacher. And, um, you know, hey, man, you, you, know, you sound like a white person. Yeah, you think it, you know, unfortunately, the kids equated getting an A with being white. And I, I, I got beat down for that. I, mm-hmm. took, I took some series of uh, beatings, beatings for that. Um, and did you have to protect your little brothers as well? I tried. I, I wasn't great at it. I'm ashamed to say I wasn't, you know, I was skinny. They were skinny. We were little. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. But I had it. I think, you know, in many ways, perhaps I had it a little harder than them, um, which is which is good in, in some ways. But. Um, I was, I, I really did love school. I honestly, growing up in Harlem and growing up in the ghetto, um, with, you know, it's, it's tough for parents, right? And it's tough for these, for, for all kids, particularly if you're a kid who wants to excel. And if you can learn the art of hiding a, to a degree, your intelligence, the problem with that though, when you hide it, no one sees it. Not even teachers who may be able to help you, give you a little bit of extra help. You know, I went to school in Alabama once outside of the military. You know, my father's in, in, in Vietnam and, you know, my, my mom, we moved to Alabama for a little while. I went to school in Birmingham and I was like two years ahead of everyone. I, I was like a godsend for the teacher. He was so happy to see me every day. It's like we were talking about Greek mythology all day long. I thought he was going to crack open a beer and just me and him, you know, we talk about it. And same thing when I went to the school in Harlem. I was so far ahead. And I didn't really understand at that particular time, obviously, the ramifications of all of that until later on. Um, and, you know, I never heard of an achievement gap and all that stuff, you know. But it was tough. And it's tough uh, to, to sort of to excel in those environments. Uh, there's a guy named Jim Clark. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. Uh, he's I don't think anyone really has this distinction of building three separate billion dollar p- businesses. So. Michael Lewis, I think, wrote wrote a book about him called The New New Thing. Oh, I know the book. Yeah, yeah. So in the book, he follows Jim Clark around and he, you know, shadows him. That's how his style, you know, that's his style of writing. And there's a guy who's always with Jim Clark, a guy from India. So I, th- I mean, so they want permission. Hey, you know, can we ask him a few questions? So they so he ends up, I think Lewis ends up uh, interviewing this guy. And, and part of the story that I found so intriguing is he lived in a small village in India. And his sister was like the prettiest girl in the village. And one day he came home from, from school and she was getting all dolled up. You know, she had a date. So he said, oh, OK. You know, so he asked, you know, who is it with? And when she told him, he said, oh, he's like the ugliest guy in the village. You know what his sister said? Yes, but he's the smartest. Think about that and think about all of the engineers that India graduates every year. All of the Silicon Valley jobs in America that are filled by Indians. 
and think about the neighborhoods I grew up in and neighborhoods across this country to this very day. If you dare even show uh, intelligence or being inquisitive, you can get beaten up. Is that true still today? It is sadly true in many places today. And, do, and that's not just Harlem. Do you think that's true in many urban cities a- across absolutely. America? Absolutely. For the full podcast, go to foxnewspodcast.com.